Hello, good morning and welcome to you all and a huge thank you to coming to this inaugural event. I'm Richard Graham. I have the huge honour of chairing the Westminster Foundation for Democracy and I want to give a big welcome on behalf of Parliament as well as WFD to today's event. This is a joint event, WFD and CEDAR. And for those who are good at acronyms, you will all know that CEDAR is the Centre for Elections, Democracy, Accountability and Representation, pause for breath, at the University of Birmingham. Wonderfully represented by Professor Nick Cheeseman, about whom more in a moment or two. But this is our inaugural lecture on the state of democracy in the world, 2023. This was an idea that I had some years ago and has come to fruition thanks to the hard work of many people and particularly my colleagues, Anthony Smith and others in the WFD. And what a time to launch this event with invasions and hideous loss of life in both Europe and the Middle East. I always thought that air raids and air raid shelters were part of the experience of my parents' generation in this continent, not ours. And that came to an end, that belief, two weeks ago in Kyiv. Today, in fact, just one out of five people in the world live in countries rated as free. And the levels of democracy around the world have been declining now for 17 years. So the backdrop to this inaugural lecture is somber. We all have much to do if our legacy to today's young is to be more than, well, we did our best, but please do better. So let me say a few words first about today's event, our partnership with the University of Birmingham, and then introduce our remarkable special guest and our two other distinguished speakers. The partnership with the University of Birmingham uh, has been remarkable during its first seven years, and that is now linked to CEDA. I believe this has enabled their independent researchers to have access to active and pressing work to address the effectiveness of political systems around the world. And it's given the WFD, the FCDO and others, learning and knowledge that we all need to improve the way that we work. So I'm really pleased that we're working in partnership to establish this lecture series, which could not be more relevant. The decline of democracy threatens all our security. We know that democracy helps protect individual rights, reduces the risk of conflict, and increases the likelihood of sustainable economic growth and effective social policies. So we wanted to start this lecture series to highlight the human stories that underpin the promise of democracy and the struggle to defend it. We want to learn from the experiences of other countries and by God, going to Ukraine is a learning experience as we tackle this common challenge. We want to bring focus to democracy defenders and those that put themselves at risk, as our guest speaker has done, for the sake of democracy, often overshadowed by autocrats and dictators. And we want to hear their ideas about the challenges and opportunities ahead. And all of this, we believe, should help identify the way forward to strengthen democracy globally. So today, I am really honoured to introduce Svetlana Chikhanuskaya as the inaugural WFD Democracy Lecturer. Svetlana, you need very little introduction as the leader of the Belarusian Democratic Opposition Movement and head of the United Transitional Cabinet of Belarus. For everybody in this room, I suspect you were the real winner of the presidential election. As many of you will know, Svetlana stood against Lukashenko in the 2020 presidential elections after her husband, Sergei, was barred from running, arrested, and imprisoned 
and he remains in prison. Lukashenko has declared the winner of these flawed and fraudulent elections and Svetlana was forced into exile in Lithuania. That inspired unprecedented peaceful pro-democracy protests in Belarus. And after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Svetlana announced the anti-war movement to prevent the participation of Belarus in that invasion of Ukraine. She's visited 28 countries, gathering support and advocating for the release of more than 1,500 political prisoners and a peaceful transition of power through free and fair elections, which was your main motivation for standing at that time. So Svetlana has direct experience of a struggle to defend democracy and has paid a huge personal price in her own family and we're honored to be hearing from her today. After her lecture, she will then be joined in conversation here by Dame Melinda Simmons, well known to everybody as our former ambassador in Ukraine, whose blogs and videos and social media brought it all alive to millions of people. Conflict and stabilization themes have run through, I think, Melinda, your entire career. Uh, whether working uh, in the FCDO or for the National Security Secretariat at the Cabinet Office, setting up the cross-government fund focused on prevention and resolution of violent conflict. And both of them will also be joined by Professor Nick Cheeseman, the Professor of Democracy at the University of Birmingham, our key partner for both this lecture and work in general on democracy. And Nick, I know that you will moderate the conversation um, but I hope that it will be an exciting one rather than a moderate one. <laughs> and take all the audience questions. And Nick, who was formerly the director of the African Studies Centre at Oxford University and the author of a great book, which I read some years ago when I joined WFD, called How to Rig Elections. Um, and the object of the exercise was how not to rig them rather than encouraging us on how to rig them. But he's the founding director of the CEDA Centre. So ladies and gentlemen, there is, I hope, a really good um, discussion and inspiration to be had this morning. And the inspiration starts now by welcoming to the stage Svetlana Chikhanouskaya. Dear Richard, Your Excellency Dame Melinda Simmons, dear guests, dear friends of Belarus, I am deeply honored to be the first one to deliver this annual lecture on the state of democracy in the world. I heartily thank to WFD and CEDA for this opportunity. You know, I think it's a common feeling that democracy around the world is in danger. It is said to realize that only 20% of the world's population live in a country rated as free by Freedom House. Lately, democracy is not just in a decline, it's under attack. And one of the brutal attacks on democracy has been carried out in Belarus by Lukashenko regime for three years now. Support, supported by Russia, this attack led to Russia's military presence in Belarus. It made possible the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, in which Lukashenko is Putin's accomplice. You know, I'm convinced that the West could have prevented this bloody war by erecting alien and harsha to what Lukashenko was doing to Belarusians in 2020. If our peaceful revolution succeeded then, the war would probably have never started. You know, as I often say, tyranny is like a cancer. If not dealt with properly, it spills over entire region. This is exactly what happened in the case of Belarus. 
The members of the so-called Dictators Club learn from each other and support each other. Lukashenko's media, as well as Putin's, were cheering after the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel. Propaganda wrote that this attack was the victory of Minsk and Moscow. Tyrants are mongering hate against the democratic world among the population of their countries. You know, after 9-11, people in the United States were asking, why do they hate us? They do because the existence of Western democracies proves to the people of the globe that another world is possible. Democracy is more attractive and more effective than tyranny. It's more successful economically. To live in democracy means to live in security, peace, and prosperity. This is why people from all over the world are attracted by the way of life or in Western democratic societies. They also want their share in prosperity and peace. They don't look up to authoritarian countries, but unfortunately, not all of them succeeded in building democracy at home. You know, to live in democracy means to live in the 21st century. To live in a dictatorship means to live in the times of the Cold War or even, in some cases, in the Middle Ages. Belarusians chose democracy in 2020, and they have never changed their mind since then. They want to live in an independent, free, modern country, but not in a totalitarian system. But they have had time staying true to their choice in a country controlled by a violent Kremlin-backed regime. What does their life in dictatorship mean? You know, it was the British writer George Orwell who described it best. It is a world turned upside down, a world where war is peace, slavery is freedom, ignorance is strength, lies are the truth, and so on. Dictatorship is a world of fakes. Lies appeal to the human mind because they are more integrating than plain truth. The bigger the lie, the more willing are people to believe it. Tyranny means not only hatred and fake news. Tyrants also stage a fake democracy. They deprive people of their voices and turn them into an obedient and hardworking mess. Fake democracy starts with fake elections. Elections without a real choice are degraded to an empty ritual. Such were held in the Soviet Union and in Belarus after Lukashenko came to power in 1994. Manipulation and ready-made results, kidnapping and murders of political opponents, mass detentions and beatings. All this happened in Lukashenko's Belarus. Even before 2020, almost every presidential candidate other than Lukashenko ended up in jail. <clears throat> in 2020, the campaign started with the detention of presidential hopefuls Viktor Babarika and Sergei Tikhanovsky, my husband. False allegations were brought against them. I replaced my husband because I didn't want to fail him and I didn't want to fail Belarusian people who remained without alternative candidates. As housewife with two children challenged the tyrant. The authorities registered me. Lukashenko couldn't believe that a woman without any experience could beat him. Our constitution is not for women, the dictator said, but he was wrong. Me and my team, we managed to steal the show and Belarusians voted for us. Of course, Lukashenko declared his victory again, but no one believed this time. He lost his legitimacy in the eyes of Belarusian people, and hundreds of thousands went to the streets to defend their choice. Even the terror and mass repressions didn't kill people's desire for freedom. Dictatorship means fake justice. 
Belarusian courts became just another tool of political revenge. Everyone can be sentenced to several years in prison as an extremist. For what? Just for sharing or liking a post criticizing Lukashenko or Russia in social media. You are going to be arrested, beaten, and then humiliated on the so-called confession video. On those, we can see beaten and tortured people blaming themselves for crimes they never committed, just like in Stalin's times or in Orwell's books. Alexei, an IT specialist, was arrested for a comment on the internet. They came for him to his office, handcuffed him, and started beating him in the police car. They tore his ear and made him drink from a toilet bowl at the police station. After serving one year and a half in Lukashenko's prison, he managed to leave the country. And it is just one typical example of political persecution in Belarus. Since 2020, more than 50,000 people have passed through experience of detention. You know, we usually think that such things happen on a regular basis only in Iran or North Korea. No, they happen every single day in Europe, in Belarus. Situation with human rights in Belarus has become a catastrophe. Such arrests, as I have described, continue every day. In August, for example, 20 people have been detained daily. And there are at least 1,500 political prisoners. The real number is much higher, up to 5,000 at least. People are kept in harsh conditions, many of them in solitary confinement in incommunicado. I haven't heard anything about my husband for seven months already. I don't know even if he's alive. Several months ago, uh, they sent me text message saying that he was dead. At least three political prisoners died in prison. Vitold Ashurak, Nikolai Klimovich, and Alice Pushkin. Ashurak was beaten to death. Klimovich and Pushkin were denied medical assistance. Alice Pushkin, one of the best painters in Belarus, will never finish his last painting that he was working on for years. It is painting about the history of Belarusian fight for freedom. As I speak, the lives of hundreds of political prisoners are in danger for the same reason, including those of my friend like Maria Kolesnikova, Viktor Babarika, Ksenia Lutskina, and others. You know, having texted me fake news about my husband's death, Lukashenko's henchmen were trying to break me. But you know what? They didn't and they will not break me, just like they can't break the will of our political prisoners. Take Polina Sharenda Panasyuk, the mother of two children. She renounced Belarusian citizenship in protest against torture. Last year, she spent more than 200 days in isolation in the punishment cell. She was beaten and her ribs were broken. She's denied treatment and medication for her liver condition. They are literally killing her. You know, with a high of 5.5 feet, Polina now weighs only 100 pounds. Now they sentenced Polina to a new prison term for the third time in a row. But neither torture, imprisonment, nor attempt to put her in a mental ward have broken her. Dictatorship means fake humanism. Since 2020, Lukashenko has been bringing to Belarusian immigrants from the Middle East and Africa. He is using them to orchestrate a hybrid attack on the European Union. In this way, he blackmails our neighbor countries, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. And it is an orchestrated human tragedy from which the dictator hopes to benefit. Do you think he cares for refugees' lives? Of course, no. All he cares is, is his personal power. It is a fake humanism when he illegally brings Ukrainian orphans from occupied territories to Belarus. There, his propagandists brainwash them and teach them to hate Ukraine, their motherland. Lukashenko acts as if he had no part in the war. 
as if he didn't help to destroy these children's homes with Russia missiles launched from Belarus last year, as if he didn't know that to displace citizens from a, of another state, in this case Ukraine, is a war crime. Dictatorship means fake patriotism. The dictator brings Russian nuclear weapons to Belarus, saying that these are for our protection. Protection from whom? It is the tool to blackmail the neighbors and to fix Russian control over Belarus for many, many years. As a fake patriot, Lukashenko needs only those Belarusians whom he can control. Those who left the country fleeing repressions are rendered stateless by his recent decision not to renew national passports for Belarusians in exile. He just wants to get rid of them and take revenge on everyone who dared to speak up against him. Finally, dictatorship means propaganda and fake news. In Belarus, it is all anti-Western and anti-Ukrainian brainwashing and hate mongering. It endlessly goes on in the media, but not only. It starts in schools already. Wagner mercenaries, murderers that Lukashenko brought to Belarus after Prigozhin school, are invited to teach Belarusian uh, pupils. In some schools, Belarusian classical writers are banned because they wrote and fought against Russian imperialism. However, even such a massive propaganda has its limits. The regime didn't manage to convince Belarusians to join Russia in the war against Ukraine. It gives me hope that after so many years of dictatorship, people have developed resilience to lies and learned to look for the truth. So what does it mean to live in a dictatorship? It means fear. You are afraid to visit anti-government pages on the internet or to read the media proclaimed extremists. Even when writing to your family, you use encrypted messengers to avoid potential encounters with the KGB. You are afraid to keep your old photos in your phone. They can be used as evidence that you were taking part in protests three years ago. You are afraid to speak Belarusian on the streets because it makes you a, a potential enemy of the regime. You know that if they come for you, you will not be out of prison for months and probably years because there is no independent justice. There is just no way to prove that you are innocent. Presumption of guilt works instead of presumption of innocence. Given all these harshness and hardships, I sometimes hear that Belarus is a lost case. But it's not. Let me assure you, Belarus can be a success story. Why am I so positive about it? Because I know the Belarusian people. A pensioner from Minsk called me some time ago. She told me that uh, she and her female friends gather regularly to discuss politics and support each other. Aren't you afraid? I asked her. We're simply tired to be afraid, she told me. There are too many of us. They just can't arrest everyone. And people like this woman give me strength to go on on my political activities. Also, thinking about my husband doesn't leave me another choice than to continue my fight. You know, uh, my son has been hearing impaired his, since he was born, and I spent years to rehabilitate him. I didn't know if it would work out, but I just was doing what I had to do. And fighting for democracy is just the same. It can be long and challenging with no outcome guaranteed. But we have to hold on to the dream and to be ready to give it all to it. You know, Belarusians are tired of living in dictatorship for almost 30 years. Though you can't see um, any beautiful rallies like those three years ago, the resistance continued and went underground. 
It is not sleeping. It is preparing for the new wind of opportunity when it comes. Only last year, there were at least 375 acts of peaceful protest in Belarus. Recently, Belarusian railway partisans have blown up the railway track section used by Russian military. As I speak, thousands of Belarusian volunteers are fighting for Ukraine within the Ukrainian armed forces. So were thousands of Belarusians fighting in the Anders army during World War II. Fighting for Britain, they were fighting for Belarus. Today, defending Ukraine, Belarusians also fight for freedom of Belarus. The destinies of our countries are intertwined. Because Putin doesn't see no Ukraine, no Belarus as independent countries. He wants our countries to be uh, colonies without democratic institutions and without national identity. And without Belarus and, uh, Belarus and Ukraine, Putin's attempts to restore the empire are doomed to fail. Dear friend, I have no doubt that Ukraine will win this war and Belarus will be free too. However, we can't win this fight alone. We need strong allies and friends who are ready for bold steps and decisions. And I do believe that such people are today in this room. And I don't ask you to fight instead of us. Changes in Belarus are the task of Belarusians themselves. But I ask you to stand with Belarus in such a critical moment of history when the very existence of our country is under threat. I wish Belarus to be among the priorities of the British Parliament, current and future UK government. I ask you to demand from your government the strong and decisive steps in confronting Putin's and Lukashenko's tyrannies. Words of condemnation are not enough. Demand immediate withdrawal of Russian troops and weapons from Belarus. Sanction Russia for undermining Belarusian sovereignty. Current sanctions don't work in full because of loopholes. And the UK could set an example of how to fight circumvention of sanctions. Join the international coalition in support of independent and sovereign Belarus. Don't allow Belarus to become a consolation prize for Putin. While increasing sanctions on the regime increase assistance to democratic forces, civil society, independent media, human rights defenders, we have resources to sustain, but we need resources to win. Help us to restore justice. Demand the tribunal not only for Putin, but also for Lukashenko. Arrest warrant on his uh, arrest must be issued. He has a long record of crimes, crimes against humanity, orchestrated migration crisis, and finally deportation of Ukrainian children. Parliamentarians can join the all-party parliamentary group for Belarus. So let me here today uh, pay a tribute to our big friend, Tony, Sir Tony Lloyd, the group's chairman, and thank him for his steady support of Belarus. Also become good parents for political prisoners, like Boris Johnson adopted my husband yesterday. You know, many political prisoners have already served their terms. Now they need relocation and rehabilitation, and I rely also uh, on your support in this matter. There are exiled Belarusians in Britain. The regime recently deprived them of passports, and we plan to start issuing our own alternative Belarusian passport, as Baltic states were doing during the Soviet occupation. That will allow Belarusians to travel and not to lose their connection with their motherland. And I hope that the UK will be among the first to endorse this initiative. And finally, help Ukraine to win this war. Victory of Ukraine will be ultimate defeat of Putin and Lukashenko. Democratic Belarus will be a huge blow to Russian imperialism. Dear friends, fighting for free Belarus is a part of the global struggle for democracy. 
The dictators unite, so should democracies. I firmly believe that the challenges that we face today will make us only stronger. We live in a pivotal moment of the history. If you want to picture the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Orwell wrote. This is exactly the prophecy that we must prevent from coming true. Democracy itself is not a boot on anyone's face. We don't want to impose our way of life upon others. We open the door for the people of the world, welcoming them to live in the 21st century. This is exactly what Belarusians want. And no, di no dictatorship, no occupation, no terror can hold us back from fulfilling our dream to become a truly democratic European country. And I hope very much that with the help of one of the oldest European democracies, the United Kingdom, we will prevail. Thank you. Живи Belarus. Wow, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for a wonderful speech. I see tears, I see joy, I see resistance in the audience. That was, that was truly powerful and a remarkable first democracy lecture. I don't think anybody could possibly have done a better job. And one of the things that I thought you did so terrifically was to actually connect what is happening to democracy in Belarus, what is happening to democracy in Russia, to what is happening in Ukraine and to what is happening in other countries around Europe. And I think one of the things that CEDA and WFD have been really trying to communicate over the last few years is exactly that, that democracy is not just about rights, it's also about security, it's about peace, it's about conflict, it's about economic growth. And that broad range of issues means that we have to understand it is key to our own national security in the UK, as well as something for the people of Belarus. Thank you so much for that inspiration. I'm delighted now that we are joined um, by Melinda Simmons, who, uh, Dame Melinda Simmons, who as was already uh, very well introduced, but uh, was until very recently, of course, our ambassador to Ukraine. But before that has a really remarkable and truly impressive career, uh, starting off with international NGOs working on conflict resolution issues, and then working in a number of different positions across DFID and FCO, uh, including things uh, like being you know, the head of the DFID Southern Africa office in Pretoria, and the head and then director of the National uh, Security Secretariat. So I think it's a fantastic conversation we have now, because as well as having that Ukraine experience, you actually have thematic experience of many of the key issues that came up in the speech. One of the things I thought we might start with is something you touched on in the speech, and I know you've talked about in the past, which is the role of leadership, and in particular, the role of women's leadership during moments of conflict. You said in the speech that Lukashenko had almost humiliated you, said that he would allow you to stand because you were a woman and a wooden, woman couldn't win. Um, and yet, actually, you proved to be the uh, candidate who actually defeated him, were it not for his mass election rigging. And I know you've also been very interested in the role of women and the role of women in, in peace building and in particular in places like Ukraine. And I think what I wanted to start by asking you is, you know, how do you preserve that role for women? Because it is so difficult in spaces that are so violent. And some of the things that you faced are not just the physical threats, but the intimidation of your children, threats to take your children away from you and put them in an orphanage, you know, very gendered forms of violence, and yet managing to stand up against that. So I thought maybe we could start by saying something about the role of women's leadership, in particular in both Belarus and places like Ukraine. You know, such uh, patriarchal systems as uh, in, in Belarus, they uh, always underestimated women. And they, uh, actually Lukashenko's uh, brutal regime lost ties with uh, Belarusian 
society with Belarusian people. And he under underestimated actually all Belarusians. And he lost this connection and couldn't guess that uh, people of Belarus uh, are much uh, far away from him uh, in their development. So our people want to uh, go to the future and Lukashenko has always been dragging us back into Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union time. And uh, particularly is for women. You know, women are usually much stronger than uh, people got used to think about uh, them, especially in, as I said, in patriarchal systems. And uh, there is inner strength uh, inside women. And when any woman put in front of difficulties, obstacles where she has to show its strength, she always do this. And uh, uh, I see that you know in 2020 and after women took a leading role uh, in our uprising, uh, women were in front of this uh, uh, like military in black masks, you know, like, uh, defiantly you know waving our flags, and they uh, became leaders in different initiatives and organizations. And they see that women are more effective in uh, marathons on long distance. You know, they are. Uh, because maybe they got used to uh, do uh, <laughs> you know, uh, many jobs simultaneously. They're bringing up children, they're working, in, you know, they uh, very often, uh, at least you know, in, in uh, post-Soviet Union countries, men are not helping uh, with the household. You know? So uh, women get used to difficulties. Now they're showing their strength, and uh, we see how uh, our women in prisons you know, they are also, you know, continuing their fight being uh, even behind the bars. You know, and uh, of course they are humiliated constantly. They are kept in inhuman conditions, but, uh, you know, they preserve their dignity in front of this uh, administration of prison. So I, I'm really inspired by Belarusian women. They gave me, give me strength constantly. And uh, uh, so I think that uh, there will be no even discussion about the role of women, women in future of Belarus. Thank you so much. I, mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me is, you know, sometimes the power of that more inclusive approach is, is not recognized by people. The re research that WFD and CEDA have done, for example, shows that increasing the representation of women in parliament actually has concrete effects, like increasing spending on things like healthcare. There's a vast amount of research now that shows that increasing women more centrally in peace building operations actually leads to higher chances of success in terms of you know, moving away from peace. But that can be particularly difficult in the moment of conflict in countries like Ukraine and Belarus. What do you think we might be able to do you know, moving forwards to actually you know, pay respect to that and actually put that at the heart of our policy? Thank you. Well, uh, Ukraine is also patriarchal um, historically, just as Belarus. In fact, the region generally uh, has quite patriarchal society. And if I'm honest, one of the first things that we might all do is look at ourselves in the mirror because we have responded accordingly. When I uh, arrived in, in Ukraine in 2019, there were 78 diplomatic missions and uh, the number of women who headed them, 13. And by the time I left, 11. We don't have enough of a pipeline of women um, from the international community who are interested in working in security and security policy and in a part of the world that traditionally we just haven't given enough attention to and which is now forced upon us. Um, by the invasion of Ukraine. So the first thing we could do is look at our own systems when we're thinking about what we are growing in terms of working alongside uh, countries like Belarus or countries like Ukraine and think about who we are bringing in because there is nothing that inspires women um, to get involved like seeing other women getting involved. And that means we must all create that surround sound, mutually reinforcing effect. And, and that means we need to be investing in people um, with incentives to, to bring them to, uh, to this kind of work. So I think um, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say particularly about Ukraine is that uh, one of the most successful areas of reform that Ukraine was undertaking that benefited women most directly was decentralization reform, the much not talked about area uh, of reform that enabled the participation of women properly at scale for the first time in community politics and in local and regional politics in a way that still was only kind of in its you know, infancy at parliamentary level. So uh, the other way to think about this is we look at grand um, politics in the national level and frankly not much is more important when it comes to a crisis of the type that 
Belarus continues to experience and that, of course, is existential for Ukraine. But when I look at the leaders that are emerging as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, or when anyone does, you look in several areas now, you don't just look in national politics, and you can see a number uh, of new, and not just young, but new people who have found their way um, to participate as a result of that decentralization, that empowering uh, of the local communities. So the other, I think, part of the conversation is looking at this at several levels and then ensuring that that support is diversified for those levels to enable um, more women to come in. Great, thanks. I was saying, we're going to come to the audience in a moment, so please do start to get your questions ready. But maybe one more question for me, picking up on, on the speech and maybe bringing in some of that uh, point that you were just making about the different levels. You know, one of the things, as I said, I think you brought out really nicely is the interconnection between different countries and what I kind of call authoritarianism across borders. Right? The impact of authoritarianism in Russia is not contained to Russia because you can arrest protests against the war, because you can use disinformation. That impact of authoritarianism in Russia and the lack of accountability for Putin there generates a regime that has consequences around the world. Mm -hmm. In the part of the world that I know best, we're talking about you know, coups that have people in the streets waving Russian flags as they celebrate them. You gave a very powerful example of the way in which Russia and Russia's support for Lukashenko has impacted on Belarus and therefore also through that to Ukraine. But do you think that we in the West, the democracies that you were appealing to at the end, see this properly as the consequences of authoritarianism? Because my sense is that actually we tend to sometimes view these things as isolated security challenges rather than as being the inevitable consequence of a more authoritarian world. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, I see that in many countries, uh, crises in many countries are not uh, seem to be connected at all. You know, moreover, uh, when the war in Ukraine has started, not all the people or even politicians knew that Belarus has a common border with Ukraine. For them, like the picture of the world looked like, like Belarus somewhere in Australia, uh, Ukraine is somewhere <laughs> here. And they didn't know how to connect events in Belarus and events in, in, in Ukraine. And it was like uh, awful. Okay, ordinary people, but politicians, you know, it's, it's like your, your job. But uh, nevertheless, we are trying to explain that uh, what starts in one country, it can um, spell over, you know, the entire region and even further. Uh, you know, dictators, regimes actually, they are testing the red lines, they are testing borders, how far they can go until they will get like proper reaction from democratic countries. You know, they, uh, in, in, it started in Belarus. They uh, started to uh, uh, kidnap uh, people and detain people, torture people. Okay, in a couple of months there was reaction in the view of uh, like small sanctions. Okay, they hijacked airplane. Like, okay, uh, some more sanctions, but you know, no, no uh, accountability, no just, no rule of justice, nothing. <laughs> then migration crisis. Then uh, war started. So they like see how far they can go. And you know, undecisiveness of reaction, uh, not in strong steps enough, they untie hands of dictators. You know, they uh, uh, percept it as weakness uh, of democracy. And they, uh, it's uh, allowed them, you know, to help those countries, you, you know, who, who uh, start invasion in different uh, region, region, like in Israel, for example. Dictators very fast learn from each other. They are uniting against democratic countries. But as they often say, democracy has teeth. It's very important to show this teeth because you have instruments, you have tools, but what we lack of <coughs> maybe <coughs> bravery and uh, understanding uh, that uh, uh, dictators will not hesitate you know, to test new borders, new red lines. And without strong reaction, they will always like challenge uh, democracy. Thank you very much. And, and that's a point that really chimes with a, a recent report WFD brought out, which I think most of you have at the executive summary of on your chairs, which is about how not to engage with authoritarian states. And one of the things that that report calls for is a more strategic, aggressive, in a sense, response from democracies to the challenges that you, you've identified. 
Do you think, um, do we, have we been a little bit slow to identify some of the risks of this authoritarian spillover? Have we not strategized as well as the authoritarian regimes? It strikes me that you know, in, in West Africa, for example, we had three new military hunters emerge very quickly, and almost within six months, they'd signed a mutual security pact to defend each other against any intervention to try and restore democracy. And I think there is a fear that those authoritarians are working quicker, more decisively, more effectively than perhaps the democratic response. Do you share that, or do you see a more positive kind of picture? And are there kind of suggestions you might have for how the international democratic community could be more effective moving forwards? Well, um, I can't speak for, for the issue globally, but I do think that there's a, a point that might balance it a bit, which is that while we might have been slow to consider that in the case of not, not just Ukraine, of course, but the region and other former Soviet Union countries that Putin, I think, quite clearly has his eye on, um, that we may have been slow to understand that he wasn't in the market for a, you know, a negotiated way off and off ramp out of invading Ukraine. Once he decided that he was gonna do this and not just invade Ukraine, but erase Ukraine, and I continue to believe that that's the objective that Russia has for Ukraine, to erase it, that it's not just about territory. Uh, it's about people and about culture and about language and about history. All of this has to be gone, um, that it's about subjugation, not just about control. Um, and, uh, and we may have been slow to understand that because I think it is quite hard to understand for uh, you know, a culture in which we talk about trying to find ways to compromise and live together. And in this, there is no compromise. And sadly, there is no living together. There is only strength. But I believe that we have shown that strength. And actually, Ukrainians, for a long time before the invasion, were saying there is only one thing that Putin understands, and that's strength. And one of those ways that, that it's interpreted it is, of course, by military strength, but that's not the only one. Political strength, too. And that unity that uh, countries were able to bring together that has continued to sustain, and I absolutely accept there is a political debate about whether it's fracturing a bit and whether it will weather the winter and whether indeed it's going to weather the, um, the calls on its time that the uh, massacre in Israel and what may now happen in Gaza as it unfolds, what, uh, what may happen as a result of that. <clears throat> but still, that unity is not something that Putin had reckoned with. He hadn't calculated for that either. So just as we were making our assumptions about what Putin may, may, may have as kind of boundaries, Putin definitely had his preconceptions about what boundaries were for democratic countries. And I believe that that unity um, blasted that through. And it's absolutely the case that uh, in terms of sort of how much pain each side can take, you can see a kind of waiting game going on. But I think the big challenge, if you like, the huge opportunity for democracy is to ensure that unity endures because there is nothing that dictators hate worse, and that the trade, that the way in which they have traded is on that assumption of weakness, that this kind of spirit of compromise and negotiation, et cetera, that they have understood, or I think actually misunderstood about democratic countries. And so actually, I think this balances itself out a bit. Wonderful, thank you. Well, thanks also for giving us a more positive uh, takeaway there, which of course is important in terms of thinking about going forwards. Before we come to the audience, I thought maybe it would be nice to give you a moment, Svalana, just to expand a little bit on what your ask is from the United Kingdom. You, you highlighted it at the end of your speech, but I thought maybe you would want to spend a little bit longer on the kind of things that you think, for example, a country like the United Kingdom could do to support Belarus. You mentioned closing the sanction loopholes, but are there other kinds of actions that you would like to see, not just the UK, but other countries like the United States and so on, actually you know, to participate in over the next two years that would strengthen your position? You know, uh, when I'm asked in uh, different places, tell us, Svetlana, what else we can do you know, to help you, mm -hmm. I always say, do what you're already doing, but do it properly. Because half measures only harm. When they talk about sanctions, and not just words, sanctions cannot work effectively when there are such huge loopholes and the trade with, uh, with the Russian regime and Russia increased since the beginning of the war or since 2020. So uh, it means that uh, they uh, using you know, third countries or each other and continue their trade. And it's only in the arms of such powerful countries as UK uh, you know, and other European Union to stop this. Create a special uh, I don't know, mechanism of sanction uh, enforcement. For example, in the USA, there, is, uh, a second, there are secondary sanctions. Even you know, when you declare, if you state that 
uh, any organizations who will help uh, dictators to circumvent sanctions will be punished, it might work already, but we don't, we don't hear this. You know, it's like, like uh, everybody close their eyes. Okay, we impose sanctions, but how do they work? Nobody cares, because it, it's on the national jurisdiction, you know, to, uh, uh, to follow the fulfillment of sanctions, and there is always lack of capacity, lack of people, and, you know, um, uh, regimes are blossoming. You know, everything is fine, you know. Uh, Belarusian regime opens uh, Dota, uh, Belarus, Belarusian daughter enterprises in Russia, they continue to sell Belarusian goods who are under sanctions, but now they are as if they, these are uh, already uh, Russian products. And everybody knows about this, but there is no political will to change this. So finish this track, you know, it, it will be already a fantastic job. About assistance, again, to Belarusian democratic forces, to media, to uh, civil society. You know, it's very difficult to fight uh, when your people are suffering in jails, when you're always looking for some assistance, you can't work properly because propaganda, uh, for example, um, uh, regime gets billions of euros for propaganda in Belarus, and we, uh, media in exile, have to counter this propaganda and to reach every person in Belarus. How to do this, not having enough, enough uh, uh, resources for this. Uh, but sometimes I see that polit politicians think uh, uh, with their eyes only, like we don't see rallies in, in, in Belarus, so maybe everything is okay already with your country. Mm -hmm. And we are giving them evidences that people are being detained, that people are somehow, even in this tyranny, they are trying you know, to, to oppose to this regime undergroundly, facing years and years in prison, but we are trying to help us, help us to, 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 to win this fight. Accountability, three years. Three years we are collecting evidences of Lukashenko's crimes. Uh, it's, uh, I already listed this row of crimes. And till now, there is no political will to uh, launch special investigation on Lukashenko's crime. There are many excuses, uh, you know, we are not part of Rome statues, you know, all, all these things, but look, when we have to restore justice, that's impossible to do inside the country, help us to show dictators that you will not hide, you know, behind the walls, you know, or in your residence in Belarus. You have to be brought to tribunal, you have to be brought to justice on international uh, organizations, do this. Or uh, also, <clears throat> we have, uh, well-known organization Red Cross. In its mandate, you know, to work in uh, countries where conflicts are going on. We have humanitarian disaster in Belarus. It's invisible, it's like silent war against people. We, for three years, we are asking Red Cross, demand access to political prisoners. They are dying, people are dying there, the people are being tortured. We have a list of people with cancer, with, uh, heart, with diabetes, with heart attacks, nobody is, is taking care of them in prisons. It's your mandate. If you demand publicly for the world to see that you are working, that you are fulfilling your mandate, and make regime to answer publicly as well, maybe you are changing some letters you know, secretly, but it, it's not job. It's, you are not doing this for people. You are doing it just for, you know, put, put, put it on the desk, just for, for tick. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, of course, it, it's like global things that governments together with parliaments uh, can do, but on personal level. When I uh, tell, uh, ask you to become good, parent, uh, good parents for political prisoners, it's, all, it's also not just empty words. It's not just also fatigue that, yes, I'm, I, I took uh, uh, one prisoner uh, as good parents. It means that, you know, it's like your moral and human... Um, it's not obligation, but you know, you will try to contribute into uh, this person's life. You know, when a person in prison and he gets a letter from somebody from Parliament, from British Parliament, maybe we don't know it might save his life because people in prisons, because of tortures, they very often uh, commit suicide because of unbe unbearable conditions, and they always, like not always, they uh, uh, tend to think that the world forgot about them, that, you know, people uh, of democratic countries, they are not fighting, stopped fighting for them. And when they get this letter, or they know from the lawyers that uh, this particular parlamenta parliamentarian phoned to his family and asked how, how they are doing, maybe they need something, or just uh, words of support sometimes is enough, so it's much easier for this person in prison to survive. 
It's, it has very symbolic and practical uh, meaning. So I can list, you know, these this requests. Uh, and uh, again, you talked about national identity and, and, and national features of Ukraine. The same about Belarus. We see how uh, Russia is trying to erase everything Belarusian from our country. There is a process of Russification. From a abroad, it's not seen. They're just changing the signs, uh, road uh, signs uh, from Belarusian to Russian. They, uh, uh, they uh, restrict education of Belarusian uh, language and Belarusian literature in schools. For reading Belarusian book, you can be detained. So it's slowly, it's unnoticeable, it's like creeping occupation. And again, you know, the world doesn't uh, uh, notice this. So it's, uh, it, it gives opportunity for regimes, you know, to, to, to continue. And one day we can wake up and to see that uh, Belarusian language is uh, not official language anymore, only Russian. And they, just as I said in my speech, the very existence of our country and our nation is at stake. And when you, in your, uh, I don't know, social media, uh, raise the question of Belarus, describe the problems that is, exist in our country, more people will know about this. Because, uh, you know, on some events I met some British parliamentarians and they have even known about uh, uh, crises that we are experiencing in our country. So information is our tool as well. So you, it, it doesn't cost a lot. It costs one minute five minutes of your life, but it will help a lot, you know, to track attention and to highlight.